I am compelled to seek the foundations of reality, ultimate bedrock on which our world is constructed. Science in general, and physics in specific, are drilling down, way down, but not to ultimate bedrock, at least not yet. Philosophy seeks the most general features of the world, while religions claim revelations from beyond the world. I follow science assiduously, indeed primarily. I also read philosophy, even track religion. But as my age advances, my patience retreats where to go to sense, to feel most deeply, most surely that ultimate bedrock. I go to mathematics. I respect the rigor of math's proof-based certainties. I'm awed by the power of math's explanatory successes. How to explore mathematics? I begin with mathematics' claim of two transcendent attributes, truth and beauty. Is the claim valid? If so, why? Why is mathematics true and beautiful? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Truth and beauty are common terms in everyday life, the phrase even a cliché. But what do truth and beauty mean in mathematics? Take truth. Truth sounds simpler than beauty. I go to the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton to meet its director, mathematical physicist Robert Digraph. Robert, what does it mean to say mathematics is true? Mathematics is true because it, uh, it's on the ultimate uh, level of, of truth in the sense that things are proven. Uh, there's a rigorous path to construct facts, theorems, uh, starting from some beginning position. And so mathematicians are on the one hand blessed by having this very precise sense of truth but of course, they're also being cursed, actually, <laughs> by Kurt Gödel, who was here at the Institute, who proved that uh, the vast majority of uh, facts in mathematics that are true are not provable. Mm -hmm. So the, the rigor of mathematics, uh, or assumes a logical sequence of steps, uh, the violation of any one would be a contradiction, yes. and therefore is excluded. But it has to start with a set of assumptions. Yes. And so how do you build the set of assumptions because those are a priori or brute fact and people may not agree upon what, it is, what an assumption should be? Exactly. So the assumptions of mathematics are a crucial issue. And through history, I've seen that sometimes the wrong assumptions were taken as kind of self-evident. Uh -huh. And like, for instance, the existence of non-Euclidean geometry, which was like very foreign mm -hmm. to the Greeks, turns out to be possible. In fact, there's truth to it. In fact, our own universe, as shown by Einstein, is governed by these non-Euclidean geometries. Uh, and in fact, there are some questions in mathematics. The most famous one is the continuum hypothesis, where two sets of infinity, the numbers, one, two, three, four, and the points on the line. And the second one is a much larger sense of infinity than the first. But is there something in between? Uh -huh. And that actually also speaks to the fact that what is the right mathematical universe? Because you can take many axioms as your starting point. And if you start with different building blocks, you build a different universe. So which of these universes is the one that we are living in? I, as a physicist, feel that probably there's a preferred mathematical universe that actually is speaking the language that nature is speaking. But that might be a, a very biased uh, uh, point of view. Preferred from your point of view, because it, it, there's a universe associated with it. Exactly. But there may be a higher degree of beauty if there's no universe. That's true, yes. And, uh, and so there's this kind of famous saying, I think it was uh, Serre who said, you know, that uh, physicists try to find out, you know, which uh, laws God picked for the universe. <laughs> and mathematicians uh, try to find out which laws even God has to obey. Yeah. <laughs> so they produce many different universes. Yeah. Uh, it is also relates to this mathematics is being invented or discovered. Uh, it's very hard to meet a mathematician 
who doesn't feel it's being discovered because you feel you're an archaeologist. You know, you're digging in the sand, you find a little piece, and it's, it's out there. Yeah. There are two kinds of existence. Let's be sure we uh, tease them apart. The one existence is that there's a physical universe derived from a certain set of mathematics. Yes. That's one kind of existence. Yes. Another kind of existence is just the fact that there is the possibility in our universe, even though a kind of mathematics didn't actualize in a physical world, but is is also existing in, in, in a world that didn't actualize. So, so that, that's a kind of existence as well. Yeah, the second kind of existence, you know, in the mathematical sense, is also very strong. So you, if you study, for instance, you, know, you can study symmetry groups that live you know, in hundreds and thousands of dimensions, and they, you think they can never really exist as an object mm -hmm. here on, 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 in our world. If you study them, they have such an internal structure, there's such a kind of obvious existence mm. <laughs> that you really feel you're studying them as a naturalist. A physical phenomena, these things that you feel cannot exist in our universe, sometimes they pop up in a kind of camouflage, hidden in another problem. Can you imagine a universe where one or more of those mathematical sets didn't exist? It's a very deep question, you know, what, uh, in some sense, uh, in this arms race between mathematical universes and physical universes, in some sense, where, to which extent they overlap. So it begs an even deeper question. If there is some form of reality, is it always, in the end, based on mathematical foundations, on logic? And I think we found again and again that uh, nature is deeply logical if you go to its fundamental building blocks. Robert has mathematics deeply logical as the foundation of reality, a grand vision that compels me to face the core claim of mathematics that it is true. But what grounds that truth? Does it matter whether math is discovered or invented? And how does beauty relate? Still at the Institute, I pursue truth and beauty with a distinguished mathematical physicist renowned for his profound innovations. Winner of the Fields Medal in Math, Ed Witten. Ed, when you're doing math, do you feel that you are discovering what's already there or inventing what has never been uh, uh, true? Uh, I think anyone who does math or physics feels that he or she is discovering truth, not inventing things, but discovering them. Does that mean that uh, mathematics is sort of in this platonic heaven, as some people sarcastically put it, or? Well, you know, I can't contribute to philosophical understanding. I won't try. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that calculus, I'm sure, has been developed on other planets if there are advanced civilizations on other planets. Mm -hmm. Any civilization that tried understanding the natural world would find that they needed calculus to understand the motion of the planets. And if they happened to live in a solar system with only one planet, they would invent calculus to describe the motion of projectiles <laughs> that they could see around them. Or they'd invent calculus for purely mathematical reasons, because they were curious about the relation between the volume and the surface area of different shapes. And no matter where they are in the universe, they would come up with the same answer. Yes. Calculus. <laughs> I'm sure calculus is universal. Mathematicians, uh, physicists, uh, and certainly you have talked about the beauty of, uh, of, of, of equations and how they work together. How, how, can, how, how do you define that, that beauty? Uh, sometimes it's uh, simplicity, Einstein's e MC squared, or string theory is uh, famously extremely hard mathematics. So wh why is that beautiful? The beauty of something like that theory, or even something more basic like Newton's laws of motion and his use of calculus to solve them, is hard to convey if you don't live in the world of math and theoretical physics. But it's very real. It's like the beauty of music. So asking me why an equation is beautiful is a little bit like asking why a piece of music is beautiful. If you've heard it and you've experienced it, you know that it's beautiful, but you might have trouble putting that in words and explaining it to somebody else. So let, let, let's try. I mean, you've been working, obviously, in string theory, and many of the equations that you, you feel are beautiful, and you've worked on, I'm sure, orders of magnitudes of more equations that didn't work and you feel are not beautiful. So how do you distinguish between the two? I mean, a nice what? equation gives you more out than you put in. 
Okay. That's one partial answer. Okay. So, in, for example, in string theory, you put in some assumptions and then out pop gauge theory, which is the bread and butter of particle physics, mm -hmm. Einstein's theory of gravity, and a hypothetical new structure called supersymmetry. You're getting much more out than you put in. I actually would like to give a more extreme example. It's the part of the standard model that describes the nuclear force. It's called quantum chromodynamics. When you learn the language in which the theory of the strong interactions is formulated, it's actually simple. It's incredible that such simple equations can give birth to such great complexity. Nuclear physics is incredibly complicated, but it's described by extremely simple equations. Ed has mathematics as universal and foundational, with simplicity a touchstone. Universal I get, in that math works or applies everywhere. Universal seems to support or corroborate truth. But what about foundational, in that math is ultimate bedrock? Does foundational relate to beauty? I ask a physicist who almost deifies math, the author of Our Mathematical Universe, MIT's Max Tegmark. Back when I was a postdoc at the Institute of Study in Princeton, they gave us these t-shirts with a slogan on it for, of the Institute, truth and beauty, <laughs> these two goddesses. And it's, it's really striking that both truth and beauty are things we still love to argue about and get confused about what we mean by. Truth in mathematics is really very subtle because the way all mathematics ultimately works is you start by assuming that something is true that you call your axioms, and then you use that to say, well, if that's true, then that logically implies that this other thing also must be true. And that step from the first truth to the second is called the proof. And uh, So you now have two things. One is you have axioms which are assumed a priori that you don't need to prove, and then you have to have logical steps which you assume are inviolate. So those are two big assumptions you're making to begin with. Yeah, and then there's a sort of cultural relativism which has crept in, because in back in the day, a lot of people used to think that those axioms were really true in some profound sense. For example, Euclid had five axioms for geometry. One of them said that you have, to have two parallel lines, they'll never meet. And then it turned out that that isn't actually true in our physical universe. Light rays, okay. you can shine them, if space is flat, they stay parallel, but actually in a real space, <laughs> which is, can be curved, they, the axiom is violated. And instead, mathematicians sort of downgraded the truth status of their axioms and thought of the whole thing more as a game. We don't look to physics to find out which axioms about geometry are true, but rather we, what we say is now there are many different kinds of mathematical spaces, one, which is called flat, Euclidean space, where parallel lines never meet. And then we have the various kinds of curved spaces. And, and it becomes not the question of truth, but a question of, of when we look at our physical space, we're simply finding out which kind of space we live in. There might be other parts of our cosmos far away uh, where the space is curved differently. So the thing which used to be a profound statement about truth has just become downgraded to becoming part of our address, part of our cosmic zip code, really. Oh, do you live in the flat part or in the positively curved part or in the negatively curved part? But there has to be then some meta um, axiom that, that unifies those two ways of thinking uh, so that th there is something that is fundamental. Yeah, so the total mathematical reality has, in a sense, been expanded. So what mathematicians really do in an abstract sense is they study mathematical structures. There's one structure called Euclidean space with its five axioms and all its theorems, a different structure with has some hyperbolic space, and then here is another structure, then the, the whole numbers, here is another mathematical structure, <clears throat> a kalabi yau manifold, etc. Each of those structures, in order to exist, according to the great mathematician Hilbert, simply has to be free from contradictions. If, if your mathematical structure has some axioms that let you prove something and also prove the opposite of that, <laughs> then Hilbert would say not only is it inconsistent, but it just doesn't exist yeah. in the platonic space of, of structures. We really had a perspective change. To me, the really fascinating question rather is what actually exists? What mathematical structures actually exist self-consistently? Okay, so you need self-consistency to be truth. Is that your only criterion? 
I would rather say that you need self-consistency for the thing to even to exist. If you look within any given mathematical structure, you can now ask well, what properties does it have? Because you can always prove it or right. disprove it. Except Gödel threw a monkey wrench into that too and said that a lot of mathematical structures are so complicated that there are some statements about it which are neither true or false in the sense that they're probably really true, but you can never prove it. Are you claiming that truth and existence are the same thing? Can't you have something that's true that doesn't exist? I like Hilbert's definition of a mathematical existence, that a mathematical structure exists uh -huh. if it is free from contradiction. Mm -hmm. Then there's a separate question of physical existence. Right, right. So you're distinguishing between physical existence and existence meaning non-contradiction. Exactly, exactly. You mentioned truth and beauty on that yeah. T-shirt. Um, so how do they relate to each other? To me, I feel a strong sense of awe and beauty when I uh, study certain mathematical structures and, and because they're so perfect. Mm -hmm. If I think about the... A sphere, for example. The actual spheres you might see are all kind of approximate. The soccer ball isn't exactly round, not perfect, but a mathematical sphere is like absolutely perfect. All the points on it are the same distance from the center, and there's something very elegant about it, and that, that you can get this exactness, which, which always eludes us in the, in the physical world. I also find that a different sense of beauty. If you're working on a jigsaw puzzle, and finally, you manage to put the pieces together. There's a great satisfaction to that. I feel a great sense of beauty and hidden simplicity. For example, when I look at the, the Mandelbrot fractal, it looks so gorgeous and in, yet incredibly complicated. And then yet I, I know that all of that seeming complexity can be captured with an incredibly simple equation where x gets replaced by x squared plus c. And I secretly hope that it's the same with the world around us, that all this complexity can one day be captured by some equation so simple that they can all fit on my shirt. Max sees beauty in mathematical perfection and in the kind of simplicity that can describe complexities with less information. But while notions of beauty and simplicity as touchstones for math and physics are widespread, are they being challenged? If so, I think I know who might be a potential challenger. The author of Lost in Math, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray, theoretical physicist Sabine Hassenfelder. Sabine, most physicists believe that and there's some deep association between the structure of the physical world and some idealized mathematics. You've kind of had the opposite view, that uh, that kind of thinking uh, might actually be dangerous for physical progress. Is that, is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, I think what is dangerous here is that a lot of physicists are not fully aware of what they are doing. So they are really using beliefs about the beauty of natural law that they are imposing on the kind of ideas that they even look at. The world of mathematics is large. Um, so if you want to develop a new theory about um, the fundamental nature of reality, you have to make a decision. What math do you pick? And uh, what physicists do is that they use additional assumptions. You may call these metaphysical assumptions. I prefer to call them aesthetic arguments um, because that's where I think they come from. Um, it's basically this expectation that nature has to be beautiful in very specific ways. So there's this general assumption, I think, among people who work in particular in particle physics that uh, whatever we find on the next deeper level it has to be simpler than what we have now. Um, it's just that there is no good reason for this to actually be the case. Wasn't Einstein the one who said, uh, make it as simple as possible, but not, not simpler? Yes, that's right. He was a smart man. <laughs> <laughs> for example, there's this idea that the three forces that we have in a standard model are actually reflections of one unified force, which would be so much simpler, uh, it would be so much prettier. 
Um, and this idea of a grand unified theory has attracted a lot of attention. So far, there has not been any evidence that grand unification is actually, you know, real. Um, but I think that a lot of theoretical physicists still believe that it kind of has to be real because it's such a beautiful idea. If it were the case that as you got more and more fundamental in physics, you became more and more simple or concise, that would seem to undergird the idea that, that uh, fundamental pure mathematics has some sort of a... A, 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 a greater uh, participation in the foundations of reality, not just in the foundations of physics. No, I don't think so, because it's really about a particular selection of mathematics that we're talking about here. The world of mathematics is large. Um, it contains a lot of theories that would not be simple. It's just that um, those are not currently considered as candidates. Um, so physicists are really using their a very narrow-minded notion of beauty that they try to impose on the laws of nature. And I just think that this is not proper scientific methodology. It's something that scientists shouldn't be doing. And I think that they are not really aware of what they are doing, but I, they are cherry picking the examples there. They prefer to recall only the cases where arguments from beauty worked. Sabine warns that crowning beauty as the criterion for science can distort the scientific method and lead physicists astray. It's a blunt challenge to Robert, Ed, Max, many others. I'd split the baby, as it were. Beauty is a clue, not a law. I'm reminded of Einstein. To paraphrase, make it as simple as possible, but not simpler. Can beauty be described more precisely, more scientifically? I ask a philosopher of science, the author of Why Does the World Exist? Jim Holt. Jim, what is it about mathematics that um, mathematicians like to praise its, uh, its beauty? And what is it about mathematics that makes it so true? Hmm. Um, maybe the same thing. Keats, at the end of Ode on a Grecian Urn, said, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. So I thought that's a good counterexample because it's beautiful but untrue. Uh, but maybe it's not. If you try to characterize what beauty is, the, um, the best answer to that question, I think, is its organic unity. It's taking a, uh, a diversity of phenomena and unifying them. So it, it's, it's, it's unity and multiplicity. It's unifying diverse phenomena under a simple rubric. That's what uh, Newton did when he discovered his theory of gravity. He discovered in doing that, he unified uh, celestial motion, the, what's going on in the skies among the planets and so forth, and terrestrial motion, what happens when an apple falls and hits you on the noggin. If you look at really interesting truths that tell you something important about the cosmos or important about, um, or about human nature, though those truths are marked by a high level of organic unity. If you look at beautiful scientific theories, what strike us as in intuitively beautiful, their beauty does consist in the simplicity with which they unify a whole manifold of phenomena. So um, it may be that, that truth and beauty are both manifestations of a, a deeper about organic unity, which we also see, you know, our judgments of the natural world, the organisms that strike us as more kind of valuable and important are the ones that uh, are um, sort of uh, harmonious combinations of complicated processes like humans, like the human brain. Uh, yeah, this is a, a kind of, uh, you know, abstract way of looking at beauty and truth, but it does suggest that there should be an ultimate consonance uh, between them. Mathematicians claim that truth and beauty express the deep essence of mathematics. What do we make of this? Here's what I've learned. There seems to be two kinds of mathematical existence, one that undergirds our physical world and another that is not actualized but nonetheless can be studied, much as a naturalist studies diverse biological species. 
Mathematics is ubiquitous in the cosmos. A nice equation gives you more out than you put in. Mathematical beauty is idealized perfection and explanatory simplicity. Mathematics that is consistent exists. Mathematics that is not consistent, that self-contradicts, does not exist. Imposing beliefs about the beauty of nature can be dangerous, impeding progress. Follow the scientific method wherever it leads. Truth and beauty are manifestations of a deeper organic unity. Seeking ultimate bedrock, ultimate reality is a mandate for math, but it's no game for shortcuts. I'll stick with Einstein, as simple as possible, but not simpler, to get closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.